So is it the truth? Of course it's not the truth. Was he supposed to tell the truth? We're back with Nick Ackerman and Libby Casey from The Washington Post. Uh, Libby, it's about as close to you can't handle the truth as you might get in, in real life. Uh, your thoughts on some of what I was just discussing with Nick about Trump's lawyer here. Yeah, I mean, the interview last night was a masterclass, Ari, and while I enjoy being interviewed by you, I would never want to be cross-examined by you, let me just say. And your question from Mr. Takapina about whether or not there were examples of Donald Trump paying people outside of the campaign, oh, I, my reporter's notebook was open and ready to go. Like, let's hmm. list them. Let's talk about them, because that would have been a very fruitful and interesting answer. I mean, the real question that we're watching here in Washington is, what are the political ramifications of this? And you and Nicole, at the beginning of this hour, talked about so clearly how there's been a lot of skittishness, and there's been the question of whether or not it is impolitic and whether it's really risky mm. for prosecutors to, to bring charges against a former president. Can any of these, though, continue on in sort of a semi-vacuum and move forward regardless of the political landscape and regardless of Donald Trump declaring himself a candidate for president? Yeah, and Libby, you mentioned that um, this DA, the DOJ, Nick Ackerman, when he was at the DOJ with Watergate, they'll all tell you, we do the law. Uh, I'm sure Nick would say that right now under oath, and I'm sure he means it. Um, but we live in the real world. If you cover New York cases uh, and what happens, you could find politics all over the place in the environment and the pressure. It's a big city town with a big media, and we've seen DAs dragged for being uh, allegedly too tough on police or too soft on police, and it depends on who's in charge, and they are elected in the city of New York. So it's not even a big reach to talk about the fact that there's political pressures here and in other jurisdictions. So to your point, Libby, uh, on that side of it, uh, I want to get your reaction to how uh, Mr. Tacopino also hit that point. Take a look. If they bring this case, I believe this will catapult him into the White House. I believe it. Because this will show how they are weaponizing the justice system. They're taking the vote not, out of the voters' hands. Joe, that's not really relevant, is it? Oh, it's certainly relevant. What's not relevant to what? Relevant to what? To his innocence. Either he's innocent or not. Oh, no, it's not relevant to his innocence. He's innocent. And if they bring this case because he's innocent, this will catapult him to the White House. Your reaction, because what Joe argues there is, he, he says, no, it's not legally relevant, um, but he has a view. And as Nicole mentioned, this, depending on how things go, could be what the country is fixated on for a long time in the, in the upcoming period, your view. Right. Well, my colleagues here at The Washington Post, who are deeply sourced inside Trump world, say that there's a lot of anxiety and, and nervousness and tension about mm. this. But at the same time, Donald Trump is projecting a bring it on attitude. Recently at CPAC, the conservative conference right outside D.C., where I am, uh, Trump said he would absolutely stay in the 2024 race, if indicted, he sort of has this like, you know, martyr syndrome going on where he thinks that it would actually make him seem like a victim of the system to some of his supporters. And Ari, that may be true. But, you know, I've also been talking to some Republican voters who still support Donald Trump, still like some of his policies, but they're a bit sick of the drama and they're also worried about reelectability. Um, and so they are entertaining other candidates. So, you know, there, there are going to be people who support Trump no matter what, and will get on board and say this is an outrage if he is indicted. Um, but there are other people who who may just weary, get weary of the sideshow. Right. And it's not like he's a candidate who's ever won by giant margins. So if you are doing that calculus, uh, it may be that losing a point or two, it, it locks him out of the White House. Uh, Again, that's extra legal. That's outside of the courtroom. Uh, as for the, oh, it makes him stronger, I mean, that has a lot of energy of don't throw me in the briar patch, uh, but we'll see. Um, so that's Libby on the politics. Nick, um, as for all the lawyer jousting, right. Mr. Cohen finished his testimony. Um, he did call on MSNBC. He spoke with our colleague, Nicole. Here's some of what he said, including looking at um, the counterpunch from, again, his replacement. That's why this is so wild. Yeah. Uh, let's take a listen to that. I did see Ari Melber's handling of Joe Tacopina. And to be honest, I was embarrassed for him. I was actually embarrassed for our profession. He looked completely unhinged. It's one thing when you're talking to some of these other stations where facts don't matter. It's merely playing to a party of one. You're not playing to a party of one when you're sitting across the desk from Ari Melber. And he wasn't going to just accept whatever answer that Joe Tacopina decided to put out there. That's his view of, of what happened. If there is a trial, right. um, 
how would, in your experience, prosecutors use Mr. Cohen and deal with what they would certainly have, which is a jury wondering whether the defense had a point? Is Mr. Cohen legally um, not clearing the hurdle of, of beyond a reasonable doubt if he is key to this? Well, th this happens all the time. Mm -hmm. Mr. Cohen is basically what's known as an accomplice witness, which means that he was an accomplice to the defendant who committed the crime. Um, I've used accomplice witnesses as a prosecutor numerous times. I had one guy who, within five minutes of his direct testimony, I had him admit to 12 murders that he personally committed. Wow. And yet I convicted everybody with this guy. Um, he was because the, you got the jury to see it didn't matter whether this guy was bad in the eyes of the law. He was I, the worst of the but, worst. But the key... But he was saying something that was provably true about somebody else who was bad. That's right. But the key was supporting what he had to say. Yeah. I asked the jury, look at all the other evidence. Look at the other witnesses who testified. Yeah. Listen to the tapes. Listen, look at the documents yeah. that support what so he's let me, saying. I'm going to push you along. I'm not going to treat you exactly like you're a current uh, lawyer for a former president. <laughs> That's uh, great. You know, there are different levels around right. here. But I'm going to push you. Um, there's another issue facing at least the history of the DA's office. Uh, Mr. Pomerantz was a prosecutor there. We interviewed him. Uh, we also discussed this with Mr. Tacopina, and he's got a letter now, and he's pushing for an investigation of all of this. I want to show this part, and to be fair, this is a line of defense that could come up uh, in the actual trial, if there is one. Let's take a look. I believe his license will be taken from him, and I believe Alan Bragg is going to look for criminal charges. That's what I believe. That's what I've heard, but we'll see what happens there. But Lord here's what he Lord said. from who? District Attorney's Office. From someone currently working in the office? Correct. Said Correct. what? That they're looking at the conduct of Pomerantz in violation of the grand jury secrecy laws. It's, it's black and white. It's in his agreement that he Why signed. Why would they tell you that right now? Because I've been interacting with them on that topic. Would you say that in a sworn affidavit? Sure. You have a sworn affidavit you want me to sign? Well, I right mean, now? I don't doubt would it I say that? I, I, I wouldn't, say it, on, I I wouldn't say it on television if I wouldn't say it in a sworn affidavit, okay? <laughs> Uh, legally, that's a huge claim he's making. He offered no evidence for that. I want viewers to understand. Right. That's a big claim. No evidence whatsoever to support that. Um, but the final question to you, Nick, is when you look at that history, including some at least questionable choices, if not worse, by that former prosecutor, um, what do you say to the Trump defense that it taints the whole case? Totally meaningless. Absolutely has nothing to do with guilt or innocence. It has nothing to do with the evidence. It has nothing to do with whether Donald Trump committed a crime. It's a total sideshow. It is a technique that is used by defense lawyers all the time to try and tar and blame the prosecution in some way. Hmm. Uh, I had to testify so many times to various claims of prosecutorial misconduct. I mean, it's a technique and something that people use in order to try and help their client, but it has nothing, zero to do with guilt or innocence. Yeah. And, and the judges look at it that way. Yeah.